There's a smart new website that will change the way you invest using social media. Like Folio. Here to explain a team of brothers, Andy and Landon Swan, of Like Folio. And they've always been building out great technology at the intersection of social and trading. Powered by unique social data. Analyzed by legendary traders. The Like Folio broadcast starts right now. One of the most positive pieces of feedback I get about the Like Folio podcast and all of our content in general is that we are providing actionable uh, insights and truly, you know, putting ourselves out there and telling people, you know, how we would trade this information, not just giving it out and sort of letting them fend for themselves. And so today, um, I'm sitting down with Nick Fenton. Who is Hello. always on the podcast, almost with us on Like Folio. He's also the founder and owner of TickerTank.com, one of the best um, options minds that I know. And so, just wanted to sit, Nick, and have a little conversation here about options trading because I know for probably 80% of our audience, it's a pretty new concept to them. And, um, you know, I just want to kind of get into your evolution as a trader uh, because I know that I, I've seen it firsthand and it's really interesting. So I just want to get your take. So let's just start off, you know, what kind of what what turned the switch for you to to get into options trading rather than just trading stocks up and down? The big switch was 2000. I'm sorry, not 2000. What am I talking about? Uh, 1999 when uh, I was in a lot of stock positions. I had a really sizable profit in my portfolio and I, you know, everything was starting to sell off as far as there was the big tech sell off. And I was just like, okay, what is going on? Sold everything, started studying about, you know, how to protect yourself, risk management. Cause at that point I really had zero risk management talent. And first thing I started reading about was stops I was like, well, that's a great concept. It makes a lot of sense, but you know, what else? Then I got into the Warren Buffett buying puts for insurance strategy. And that kind of sparked my interest, introduced me. I knew what options were. I'd heard about them, but I just hadn't had much exposure to them. So I started in options as buying puts for insurance against positions. Quickly realized I was always losing on the buy side. So then, you know, I, naturally progress to, well, if I'm always losing on the buy side, who's on the sell side that's always winning? Why shouldn't I be on that sell side? Gotcha. So then I just continued to educate myself. I actually educated myself for about a year before I participated in any uh, short premium style trades. And I really didn't know what I was doing. To so be like what kind of resources did you learn, did you use to learn during the course of that year or, you know, since... Since then, what have you found to be the most valuable resources? One book in particular, Sheldon Natenberg's uh, Option Volatility and Pricing. I think now it's actually called Option Pricing and Volatility. I think they swapped it around for some reason. Okay. But uh, Sheldon Natenberg, he's the man. That book was incredible as far as getting me full in-depth knowledge of the options market. And that's really the only book I've read to date that I really focused on and, and give credit to. I read it three times in a row. Wow. Because it was so heavy and intense. The first time I read it, I was like, okay, I got about 10% of that. Right. I need to reread this thing. Yeah, books it's, like that are tough. Oh, man. Tough to get through. But I was I was just so passionate about it and so engaged and interested that I easily just picked the book right back up and said, okay, now that I have this base, picked up about 10% of that, let me reread it and see how much more I pick up. Second time I read it, probably got about 50, 60% of it. Next time I read it, I was like, I got this, man. Nice. Um, are there resources today that you use, um, whether it's a book or media or, you know, just what kind of, what kind of outlets do you find are talking about this kind of stuff in a way that resonates with you? Absolutely. There's only one resource that comes to mind um, in a big way, which is Tasty Trade. Mm -hmm. Tasty Trade, they really trade with the same mentality 
um, and strategic approach that I trade with. So they resonate with me really, really well. And a lot of stuff that they say, you know, the majority of the stuff they say, I already kind of know. Uh, but there's enough that they teach me and that they even learn themselves through the research that they go out and do. You know, they, they might have a thought and say, okay, research team, research this. Let's see what we come up with. Some of the stuff that they learn themselves and then, you know, they share with us, the audience, is just amazing, man. Yeah, I think it's a – and well, they're on. It's unbelievable. They're on like six, eight hours a day. don't know how they do it. I don't live know how content. they come up with that much content it's, all the uh, time. And it's free. It's free. It's pretty incredible. It's, free. Um, it's amazing. The uh, one thing I do want to say while we're talking about this is I think it's really easy to get stuck in this spiral of content consumption. If you get, for example, start picking up a few books and then watching a bunch of YouTube videos, you have to be really careful that you don't over noise yourself. Right. There's so much noise out there. It can be extremely counterproductive. Yeah, do you think, um, I mean, I'm of the opinion that books and videos and things like that, just in life in general, can give you a great baseline knowledge, a foundation of knowledge um, that you probably can't get anywhere else. But it's never enough for me. It's like I always have to experience it firsthand before I truly get it or start to get better. Is Is it that way? Was it that way for you with options? Was it, you know, did you paper trade or anything like that? Or did you just jump right in with real money? Jumped in. Yeah. Um, and I think that it, what you're saying there is 100% applicable to trading as far as you have to get your feet wet. You know, you can read and you can consume all this stuff and think you have a good idea of how to do it. But until you actually apply that knowledge on a consistent basis and have the real life experience, you don't know what the hell you're doing. Right. Because when I read that book three times and I stepped in and I tried to start, I had no idea what I was doing. Right. I knew, I, you know, I knew stuff. I knew information, but actually applying that in the real market with real capital, boy, is that a totally different thing. It reminds me of a um, funny story when I was, very vivid memory when I was 10 years old. We had, we were on this uh, t-ball team mm -hmm. or not t-ball, little league team. And my dad was the coach. And there's another kid on the team named Robbie. And I swear this kid could not throw the ball 10 feet. <laughs> okay. Um, just developed later in life, you know, sure. whatever. Um, but we go, he lived in our neighborhood. And we go to pick him up on the way to a game one day. And he said to my dad, uh, coach Bob, I want to pitch today. Ooh. And my dad said, Robbie, I don't know about that. What, what sparked this in you? And Robbie said, well, for the last two days, I've been reading this book, how to throw a curveball," <laughs> And it just stuck with me. Oh, like I, I'll never forget it because I remember thinking, I mean, he was sold. He, he really thought but that by reading this book, uh, you know, he's going to step up on that mound and throw a curveball over the plate in a game situation. And, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's a great story because it's, uh, you know, that sort of innocence of youth type of thing, but, but also, um, you know, kind of gets back to what we're talking about. You got to get in there and do it. And you don't have to be young to be that naive. Right. Exactly. You just have to be new to the, to whatever you're exactly. trying. Exactly. I mean, you I know do how that many people I talk to that, you know, call called me via ticker tank and say, Nick, I just finished reading this. I'm really excited. I'm ready to get in the game. Tell me what you think about this trade. I think it's going to be a huge winner. I'm like, well, I don't like it because this, 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 and right. this. They're like, what do you mean? What? What's that, 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 that mean? You know, it's a, yeah, I think it's really important for people to realize that there's no bulletproof method that you're going to read about in a book. Never. Uh, you have to build that knowledge yourself. So that's a, you talk to people all the time that are options traders, mm -hmm. new learning options traders. You do some coaching. What are some of those mistakes or kind of common flaws that people have as they're starting to get into options? There's three consistent common flaws 
first one, they're as beginners, they're always buying. You know, they're always buying to open positions. They're buying puts. They're buying calls. They're not even buying spreads. They're just straight up buying puts and calls. And um, the second thing is they tend to have a lot of fear entering into positions. So let's say they've gotten through the buying puts and calls portion and now they're doing spreads and they have their criteria down and they know that things are lined up well based on their specific criteria or criteria they've learned elsewhere. But it's really hard for them to take that step to actually commit their capital to the trade. So uh, that just comes down to human psychology. Do you think that's because they're scared of losing money or is it because they're scared that they're doing it wrong? I think it's a combination of lacking the confidence to be sure that they're doing it correctly. But um, I also think there's a lot of risk, you know, psychology in, in that. I mean, I to this day, I have trepidation entering a position. Yeah. I, th- I just think, you know, I don't think that'll ever go away for me. Right. I think it's probably a good thing. I don't think you want it to completely go away. I think as soon as you think you're bulletproof. Does that make you a sociopath? <laughs> yeah, probably <laughs> so. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I think one thing I've noticed about um, people is a lot of that comes from this kind of, I, I what I see all the time is kind of different than what you're describing. It's uh, people will get into positions at from a, a state of mind of greed, like looking at the profit potential of the trade, and they'll go a little or a lot heavier than they should because of that greed. And then as soon as they're in, entered into the trade and it starts to go against them in any way, that's when they realize the risks that they've just taken. And that's when they get really freaked out and scared. And so now you're in a position, that's the worst case, because sure. now you're in a position that you don't, that you probably can't handle. And, um, and it's all because you looked purely at the, the profit potential or the greed side of the trade rather than the fear side of the trade before you got into it. Um, yeah. And that's, that would probably apply more to like a super beginner. The people that I talk to generally are, you know, past that super beginner stage. They're either beginners or intermediates and oftentimes advanced traders as well. The third thing I see a lot and um, this is more with intermediate, is the greed factor where they know they should be taking profits on a position and they say, I'm just going to hold out for a little bit longer here. I just want to squeeze a little just more squeeze blood. A little bit, and then all of a sudden the position turns on them and they turn it into a losing position because it turns on them a little bit and they're like, well, now I just want to get back to that right. place where I was initially wanting to take profits that I've already seen, but I didn't take profits when it was there. But now it's going to go back there. I'm sure of it. That psychology is so then brutal. Then it gets worse. And they're like, well, I'll just let it get back to where it was just a minute ago. Then you're in a losing position, next thing you know. And now all you want to do is break even. And then even that won't happen. Then, You'll let it roll all the way to max loss. Exactly. Um, that's happened to me, for sure. It's happened to me. Um, all these things have happened to me. Yeah. That's a brutal psychology. But I hear it all the time. Yeah. That's a brutal psychology. I think one of the biggest... Um, one of the hardest things to do for a trader is to ignore the price that they paid. Um, in most respects, that is irrelevant. There's a whole market out there telling you what the price of this thing is now. And the price that you paid is not on any one of their sheets. Um, and so it's not a significant number to anybody but you. And once you realize that, you know, you can sort of distance yourself from it. And so, you know, getting back to the point where you were with this profit or getting it back to break even, it doesn't matter to the market. So it really shouldn't matter to you. Absolutely not. One thing that I do to battle that is I'll automate. So I'll set a good till cancel order for where I want to take profits. And I'll put that order, that good till cancel order in right when that position fills on, on entry. So the entry order will fill. I'll immediately put a go till cancel order to take profits at my profit objective. I don't put stops in, but I take, I do put automated profit taking orders in 100% of the time. Just makes it all mechanical, takes all the psychology out of it. I can be at lunch, get a ding on my phone. Whoa. Hey, auto- Nick. Automated profit taking. Nick, you made money. That's awesome. That's cool when your phone buzzes with a little cha ching. Sure is. 
Um, so what's your favorite setup of, um, yeah, I don't want to get too deep into things here. I think we've already covered some great stuff, uh, for people that are getting into options, but let's go through your favorite setup or your favorite type of spread to utilize, um, just kind of, kind of quickly and generally speaking. I mean, my favorite setup is when a stock pulls back significantly to a really defined support level. And during that pullback, the volatility of that stock has gone through the roof. So you have a combination of extremely high volatility and a stock price that's been beaten down and is currently at a really strong, say, multi-year support level. It's a beautiful situation. I just sell puts to the max. So how do you, um, how do you determine the volatility level of a stock? Well, you say the, the implied volatility uh-huh. is going up. How as a, trader uh as a new options trader how do i see that it's a great question thinkorswim is what i utilize it's a trading platform i utilize um i on the charts i go to studies and then i go to volatility studies and then i pull up imp volatility which stands for implied volatility and basically anything 50 if you're looking at a 52 week chart it's going to be a sub graph that's below your price chart and it's going to show you the 52 weeks of volatility range. And it's going to show you the all the movements that it's done in vol- volatility. Low end of the range, high end of the range. So you can see the, an actual chart of what implied volatility has been in the past and see whether you're high or low in that range for that particular stock. Correct. Correct. Because that's really you know, important, right? Three-year chart. Five, it is. It's a forward-looking indicator. It's the only forward-looking indicator that I know of within the Thinkorswim software until they bring these social signals in. So right now there's one forward looking indicator. Everything else is backward looking. Right. Now implied volatility does have some backward looking information calculated into the, into it, but it's a forward looking indicator. Got it. You know what it's what the options market anticipates the price of the stock is going to be in the future. Right. And anticipates how much volatility that stock will have in the future. Correct. And so, and that can vary quite a bit stock to stock. So Absolutely. a high implied volatility for General Electric is not the same as a high implied volatility for Netflix. Correct. Yeah. High for General Electric might be um, 30%. High for Netflix might be 120%. Got it. That's, and you said you, um, you're looking that up in Think or Swim. And just for people that are listening, we got to give a plug to our partner, um, TD Ameritrade owns the Thinkorswim trading platform. It's the platform that everyone really that I know uh, uses. It's, I've been using it for, I can't remember, 15 years probably, however long it's been around. I've been uh, in since 2006. Since 2006, so probably I'm probably like 13 years. Um, and, it's, and if you want to um, open an account at, TD Ameritrade, just hit me up, Andy at likefolio.com. We've got a great relationship with them where if you open an account through our button, we get credit for that and uh, your account gets a nice bonus when you fund it. So hit us up. I think um, that's a win-win for everybody. Um, All right. So we've gone through your favorite setup. Now one more because we don't want anybody feeling bulletproof leaving this. Um, what do you think in talking to, you know, cause I have this theory, um, just in life in general and, and, um, trading, uh, different things like when I see a, uh, a line come out on a game, a, a sports betting line, and you look at the line and you say, that doesn't make sense. And so you think you should bet, uh, the obvious, thing. the obvious thing, but, it almost, that almost always comes back to bite you. And it's an indication that somebody knows something you don't know, right? Or they're trying to sucker you into this. And so these too good to be true setups. Yeah. I especially look at over unders. If the, if the over under seems ridiculously low, you know, everybody's betting the over. Yeah. It's like, okay, they know something. Something's not right here. I got to bet the under, even though this over under number is so low. Right. And the same thing happens in the stock market. Um, there's not necessarily a big, you know, it's not like in Vegas where there's a bookmaker actually trying to set you up into the wrong side of a, of a bet, but there's so much market psychology 
uh, and so much, you know, crowd mentality or herd mentality in the stock market that I think um, those sort of too good to be true setups uh, happen sometimes. Uh, so anyway, I just answered my own question for me, for you, what, what do you think is sort of that worst kind of sucker setup that you see people fall for um, that sometimes backfires on them? I think uh, as soon as you start, so something that comes to mind is gold back when it was rallying a couple of years ago and we saw it and it was pulling all the way up to 1700. Everybody's like, dude, gold's just going to continue flying higher. The media's all over it. You know, your parents are all over it. So as soon as I started seeing all that stuff, I told, I personally went and melted all the gold that I had from all these gold chains back in high school and stuff. No way. <laughs> Swear. And I talked my mom and my sister into it. I was like, look, you have to listen to me. Melt your gold that you don't use. They all melted it. Um, I shorted, I took a big bearish position in gold myself. And of course it came crashing down because the entire public anticipated it going higher and the media was spanking on it going higher. So when every, so when the trend matches the headlines and matches what your, aunt who has really no business in the financial market says when all three of those things happen at the same time, you can be pretty sure that the move is close to over. Absolutely. Almost certain, man. Almost yeah. certain. And another thing that just came to mind is Christmas, This uh, Christmas 2015. <clears throat> um, crude oil is at about 32 a barrel. Everybody's going, Nick, I, crude's going to, to 20, isn't it? It's going to 20. It's going to 15. It's, you know, it's got to go lower. I'm like, I've already been thinking that this is the bottom. It's definitely the bottom. Yeah. Just the opposite of that big crowd move. And whatever the media is saying, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, how do you melt? How do you do that melt gold? You and take it to where your, do you go sell it? You just take it to one of those gold shops. Okay. You know, we buy gold. And they just melt it down right there? Well, they'll give you a specific, they, they sit there and make sure that it's, you know, legit gold, mm -hmm. and then they'll give you seventy cents on the dollar or seventy-five cents on the to dollar market price per ounce. Yep. Cool. And well, this was awesome. That's how it's done, man. Just go melt that. Hey, you know that's when you know you have conviction in a trade. <laughs> when you're gonna tell your mom when you're to melt, go melt her tangible <laughs> items, <laughs> melt her earrings. <laughs> oh man, to be a fly on the wall during that dinner conversation <laughs> all right man this was awesome uh if people have questions they should definitely check out tickertank.com check out ticker tank on youtube too i mean there is a gold mine of speaking of gold there's a gold mine of information there uh nick oh. is available what's your uh what email can people reach you at nick at ticker tank.com i do want to say one quick thing about my youtube channel um that's if if i wasn't me <laughs> but I traded like me, I would definitely benefit from my YouTube channel. And I'm not saying that because it's me creating the content. I'm saying that because I get nothing but positive feedback um, on the channel. I literally create this content with the intention of being full disclosure, leaving zero mystery behind what I'm saying, not being the guy that says, I'm going to you know, tell you nine out of 10 important things, but the 10 things are the most important in order to get it. Right. You have to pay me a couple thousand bucks. I'm going to give you everything. Yeah. So check it out. Yeah. YouTube.com forward slash ticker tank. It, it is, uh, it's a really cool channel and you're a great resource to have in here for like folio as well. So, um, again, everybody, this, um, this content is somewhat, uh, brought to you by TD Ameritrade. So seriously, if you're looking at opening a brokerage account, looking into getting started with options, you got two great resources here uh, that you can reach out to anytime. Uh, and, you know, I can also send you that link to get uh, your account opened with TD Ameritrade, which uh, helps like Folio and uh, gets you a nice bonus. So that's cool. Yeah. So if you're serious about options, you have to use Thinkorswim. It's just, yeah. it's just the best, period. It, yeah, it's, it's the one to use. There's no doubt about it. Um, all right, cool. And then, you know, follow us. Like Folio on Twitter, make sure you're subscribed to the podcast, whatever podcasting, iTunes, whatever you use, 
Uh, just search for Like Folio, hit subscribe, and uh, download the app. The podcasts are all in there as well as our content. So uh, appreciate everyone. Appreciate you, Nick. And uh, until next time, may your trading be as profitable as Nick's gold earrings melted down. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>